Moving on with the program today, it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Anthony Brown, who will be speaking about the role of health consumers in the development of reserve group. Dr. Brown is the Executive Director of Health Consumers New South Wales, the peak body of patient and health consumers in New South Wales. Please join me in welcoming you. Welcome in. Thank you, Judy, and thank you, John. And um, before we go any further, I think I've got to draw attention to Judy's fantastic shoes. So yeah. <laughs> they have to be the best shoes that you can They're amazing. Um, and I'm very sorry I wasn't able to see um, see those shoes in action on the dance floor, and I'm sure they were last started at the cocktail. <laughs> um, okay, so um, thank you very, very much for inviting me to be here today. Um, and thank you, um, Michelle and John, for your long um, partnership and association with Health Consumers New South Wales. Now, I hope that bells to keep me to time. It is. Fantastic, because. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to tell you. No, no, I, 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 it has to be done, so I'm glad. I'll give you a two minute warning. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So before I start, and I hope this drives things, so I would like to, of course, acknowledge the traditional owners, um, the Darug people, um, and their elders past, present, and emerging, and any and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people for joining us today. Um, I think acknowledgements like this are really important, particularly when we're talking about health, because for two reasons. I really believe if we get health and health services right for Aboriginal people, we'll get it right for all of us. That's a bit selfish, but I really believe that. And I also think that Aboriginal people and Aboriginal culture has a way of talking to and involving everybody that we have a lot to learn. Um, so I think that it's important in health, when we're talking about health, to reflect on that. I'd also like to acknowledge the leaders of the health consum consumer movement over the years um, and uh, the work that the association has done um, in bringing people who've had an experience of stroke together uh, and um, I want to acknowledge John and Michelle in particular as two leaders who have been very involved from the beginning with Health Consumers New South Wales. And I've got a photo here of one of our founders, um, the late, great Betty Johnson, AO, um, and Betty, together with Sally Crossing, over a period of 10 plus years, worked really hard to get our organisation up and running. So we're a body, we're a peak or an umbrella group for people who use health services in New South Wales. We're independent of, of government, although we get funding from government, which we're grateful for, and we're also member-based. So one of our members, one of our founding members, is the Stroke Recovery Association, but we have 55 or 56 other groups who are members. Some of those are groups like Cancer Voices, um, who, who speak for people who um, have had a cancer diagnosis, some are groups like B, which is for people with a mental health diagnosis. So all of those groups that are dealing with specific conditions. We also have close to 800 individual members who are involved in some of the activities that I'll talk about. They're people who are working really hard to make sure that the voice and the experience of people who use health services um, are actually brought into and involved in the decision making. We believe that health services are better if the people who use them are involved in putting them together, in designing them, and even helping to run them. At that great phrase, which I'm sure you've heard nothing about us without us, was Betty's catchphrase. We use it a lot. It actually originally came from um, the disability movement, but um, I think that's that's really a great summary of what we believe. Nothing about us without us, and we have to be involved if we want health services 
to do um, what we really want them to do. So I wanted just for a minute to talk about this term, health consumers, um, because some people love it, some people don't love it so much. Um, but it, it's used to talk about people who use, have used, or are potential users, so that's all of us really, of, of health services. And that's not just patients, but including family and carers. Um, this term um, sort of had its origin in about the 1990s, and it was people who use mental health services who were the ones who first brought it to prominence. And for them, it was about reminding the staff and the people who run health services that as consumers, we have consumer rights. Um, if we buy a TV and there's something wrong with it, um, we've got rights to, um, to get it fixed, to make sure it's better. Um, and better for, for people who buy a TV in the future. And so it was about that emphasis on rights that the health consumer movement um, was born, the one that chose those night, that name. Um, one of the other things that, um, other terms that's been used a lot um, has been this term lived experience. And is that something for me, people have heard lived experience and you know, I'm often asked what that means. Now I know a lot of you here are um, probably familiar with it, but I just wanted to, I suppose, just give a reflection on what that means to me and why I think it's, it, it's a great term that's a bit different um, and expands on the idea of, of health consumers. I think the term, we use lived experience, but we forget one little word um, about that, that we're really talking about the lived experience of something. We use it as shorthand to talk about um, experience and people say, well, we are all alive and we all have experiences, so we all have this experience. Well, yes, we do. But it's really asking about what's it like? What's it like to be on the inside of an experience, if you like? What's it like to be the person who experiences and who something happens to? And so for many people in this room, I would suggest that we're actually talking about the lived experience of having a stroke, of the treatment associated with that, of recovery, and then of living with the consequences of all of these things. So while the term health consumer has a focus on health services, and for health consumers in New South Wales, that's our main focus, we want to make health service better. The term lived experience is about bringing together all of those experiences that we have, not just of our time in health services, um, as critical as that is, but what that time in health services actually then means for the rest of our lives. And it's that lived experience that we want to help bring into health services so that the people who are putting health services together have that better understanding of what it's like for people. So we can make services that better respond to, um, uh, to people. So, um, and why is this, this important? Well, I, I like this little um, diagram because I think it reminds us of, of what things are actually like for people. So here you can see someone's gone to great trouble to design what looks like quite an attractive park. There's some you know, nice, nice pathways and trees um, and thought, well, this is the way we want people to use it. But in reality, the people who use that park, um, they've found a better way and something that sort of works for them and is reflecting of what they really want things to be. So sometimes with the best will in the world, people can design something for us doesn't quite meet our needs all the time. So it sort of gets us to where we probably want to go, but we know that there's other ways to do it and it could be a bit better. Um, and so at Health Consumers New South Wales, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to uh, make people aware of this. And we do this, jump ahead again. Okay. Um, what we, try and do is look at how we can involve and engage people um, who use health services 
in the decision making processes? How do we get people into the room when new policies and guidelines are being written? How do we get people into the room when new services are being planned, when new hospitals are being built, um, and when new treatments are being developed? And importantly, in those day-to-day -day things that health services do, when they're evaluating how good their services are, when they're looking at how they run their governance, and even increasingly into research into new treatments and to new ways of doing things, how do we bring people in? And we call that process consumer engagement, but it's, sometimes it's called participation or partnering or involvement, and they all mean um, similar things. Um, and sometimes engagement is used to mean something completely different. It might be used to mean how do we get more people to use our service? And we're actually saying we, we're talking about how do we get more people involved to design the service. Um, this fits quite closely with something that I hope people in this room are, are familiar with. And, and if not, I'd encourage you to, um, to have a look at this. This is something that should be on display in every hospital and every health service um, across the country. And I'm not just saying that because I'd like to see it on display. When it was put out um, by uh, the government um, a few years ago, by the Australian Commission of Safety and Quality in Healthcare, um, that was their uh, recommendation um, that these people need to know about what our rights are when we use health services. And as I said at the start, that term health consumers actually comes from the idea that we have rights. Um, and so I'm not going to go through all of these rights. It's not a talk about our rights as health um, consumers, but they're there and they're out there and something I encourage people to look at. But one of those rights is there is a right around partnership. Now, there's a right that we're partners in our own uh, in our own treatment, that we fully consent to what the treatments are, that we know what our options are, and that we're involved in the decisions that affect our own treatment um, on an ongoing way. So there's that partnership. But there's also the partnership that I've been talking about, that we actually have a right to be involved in those sort of engagement activities that I was, I was talking about. Um, and I've included a quote from, um, from this quite significant um, declaration that the World Health Organization put out back in 1974 when they talked about the right that we all have to participate in the planning of health care, both individually and then collectively. So individually in our own treatment and collectively in what those services look like. So, So why, why would a service do this? Why would, people, why would they bother to get involved in us? We think it's a good idea. We think it leads to, to better services. Um, but health services and health systems are increasingly recognising that this is important. As I mentioned, there's a human rights and an ethical reason why we should be involved. We should be involved in decisions that affect us. There's increasing evidence that actually the more people are involved in designing services and treatments, but surprise, surprise, we have better health outcomes because they're meeting our needs. Um, it's not to say that we don't get good health outcomes um, anyway, but we get even better ones if we're involved. Um, safety and quality of the services that we get improves. Um, the way it's delivered to us um, is more understanding of our needs. It improves the relationships, not only with the individual patient, but with groups like um, Stroke Recovery Association, with groups like Health Consumers New South Wales, that these ongoing partnerships um, is you know, a, a strength that have made possible. Um, they have to do it, actually, they have to do it. They have to do it to meet our regulatory requirements. And, Every health, every public health service in the country um, has to meet certain standards. And one of those standards is that they've partnered with consumers and partnered with patients uh, in, in their planning and their governance. 
and I have to show them they've done that in order to meet their accreditation. And um, the last reason, and I think one of the most important ones, is actually we're all expecting that they will. Increasingly, health consumers, patients, carers, people who are using the health system are just expecting and demanding that our services reflect our needs. And so there's increasing expectations that we will be involved from the public and from patients. So ultimately, the reason why health services engage, and the ultimate reason they should engage, is it actually makes health services better for all of us. Um, I mentioned... Uh, okay, I'll let the drug this before the end, by the end of the talk. I mentioned the national the, the quality standards. These are the standards that, again, the Australian Commission for Safety and Quality in Healthcare puts out. And there's a standard, standard two about partnering with consumers. And that first standard about clinical governance, which is how um, our services, not just how they run, but how they're, um, um, how, how they um, regulate and manage the, um, the medical care that they provide, um, that also makes it really clear that we need to be involved in that. Um, and so again, there's actual, in order for our health services uh, to run, they have to show that they've partnered with us in the designing and governance of what they do. Um, one of the things that Health Consumers New South Wales, it does, is that we work with people who want to be involved in those sort of processes, um, and we provide training and information about how you can get, get, be involved. We talk about the importance of the standards and introduce people to, it, to them. Um, and um, you know, it's a way that people can find out more and become involved. How long have you time? Two minutes. Two minutes. There we go. Okay. You've got two minutes. Okay. All right. So this is just a fun thing that I use, again, as a way to remind people why we should involve people. Because quite literally, Consumers and patients have the view from the bed. And other people who are standing around might think they're doing something that's really good for us, but the view that we have um, is, um, is not always what they think it is. And for, for people who um, might have difficulty seeing this um, at home, this is a cartoon of a baby in the crib and two people standing around who are labeled stakeholders around the um, a toy that's hanging above the baby that's got stuffed animals swimming around. And from their perspective, um, the adults can see the toy, um, they can see the, the cute little animals and they think it's lovely, but the baby lying down when he looks up, all the baby can see is, is the animal's bottoms. <laughs> so, um, baby looks quite comfortable, but the view's a bit different. I uh, just wanted to end with a quick example to show what that actually means and hopefully bring it all together. And this is some work that happened a few years ago now, not far from here, at the Blacktown Cancer Centre. When the Blacktown Hospital was being redeveloped and they were looking at redesigning how they delivered and where they delivered chemotherapy. So one of the things that they did with this planning was they got a group of patient advocates, advocates together and former cancer patients to talk about this and they involved them in the planning. Now when they started doing this planning before they talked to the patients, the doctors and the, the admin people thought, well, when people are having chemo, it's not a pleasant time. People aren't well, um, and what we'll do is we'll give people privacy. We'll create a series of small rooms where people can have their chemo, um, and, and you know, have it um, and have some privacy and, and it's quite peaceful. They talked to people that actually received chemo and they said, well, yes, you know, you do feel terrible, yes, um, you're there for a long time, but actually it's really boring. And what's really, and if you're there at the time and your family or friends can't visit, then you just know that behind that wall is someone else who's doing this. 
And actually, would it just be nice to be with a group of people and be able to just sort of chat and sort of take your minds off what's going on. So the, the results of those discussions, not in a series of individual rooms, but what came to be called the chemo lounge. People said, we don't want something that feels really clinical. Um, we want to be able to relax and talk and look out the window. And so they designed this place where people could sit in comfortable chairs, the chemotherapy could be administered, big picture window that people could look out of, and people receiving chemo could actually talk and chat to each other and by being with each other take their mind off the fact that they're receiving chemo. So I, I really like that example because I think it shows that there was really good will in what was being put, put forward in the first place. It was this idea that, well, we've worked a lot with people, we think we know what this is like. And people themselves saying, actually, it's a bit different. In fact, it's very different. And this little change can make a big difference for what it's like for us to receive, um, to receive treatment. So I'd just like to end by, again, thanking um, uh, Michelle and John for inviting me, um, congratulating the Stroke Recovery Association for your many years of amazing work with health consumers, and inviting um, people, both individually um, and as part of the Stroke Recovery Association to look at ways that maybe we can help and work with you about being involved in some of the design um, and ongoing running of, um, of health services. And I know many of you in the room are already involved in activities like this. So thank you very much. All right, so thank you all very much. wonderful presentation. I'm sure that many of you will know Alex Eagle, Dr. Brenda Booth, OAM, who will be discuss discussing how stroke has been, been impacted by the consumer voice. Also, also, she needs no introduction. Brenda is a stroke consumer advocate and the co-president of the Working Act Group, Stroke Wags on the Central Coast. Well, please welcome Brenda. say thank you to the Stroke Recovery Association for asking me to do this and, um, and a massive thank you to Michelle Sharkey who did my PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> um, I, I couldn't have done it without her and Carolyn is very kindly going to um, progress my slides because I can't talk and click at the same time. So um, yeah. Um, I've been asked to talk today about how, can you, how the consumer voice has brought about change and my involvement as a stroke consumer. The consumer voice has influenced the progress and advancements in stroke treatment and care. My stroke was over 21 years ago and the clopper skin drug called thrombolysis wasn't being used to treat stroke back then. Stroke units well, we heard yesterday that they had only just started, but technically stroke units didn't exist in hospitals back then. And things were very different. <clears throat> Fortunately for me, my neurologist was a part of the stroke network and he was ahead of the game. And he had created a high dependency observation board within the neurology unit. And so the staff were really trained, they were really vigilant, and I was very unstable after I had my stroke and so I, I, I really feel very strongly that had I not have been in a situation like that, my situation would have been very, very different. Um, so much has changed since 2001, but there are still many areas that need improvement in acute stroke treatment, rehab, with community support services that stroke survivors and their families require. Now, I know you've gone through uh, a, a number of things that I'll be talking about, but, you know. Um, so, consumer is the term that is frequently used to describe involvement as a health consumer. The term health consumer includes the person, in this case the stroke survivor, their carers and family. 
Health consumers have two roles in the health system. They are users of health services, and in more recent times, their opinions have been sought. Some, choose, some people choose to take on a stroke consumer role, providing their knowledge and experience they actively um, get involved in health service development planning and decision making. And, and it is worth noting that some people prefer the, the term person with lived experience. I'm happy to be called, called by the consumer or a person with lived experience. So, what, next one? Yeah, thank you. Um, the consumer voice starts with thoughts and ideas about their experience in the health system. In the past, occasionally people would say thank you to the health system or make a complaint. But largely, back then, there was very little input from consumers. In more recent um, times, health services have put in place procedures seeking the involvement and contributions of people who have a lived experience. Consumer engagement and participation is now intrinsically embedded within the health system. Next slide. Participating as a consumer can mean being a member of a stroke support group, which is working in collaboration with their local health district, right through to being on a working party developing national policy. Being involved as a consumer is about working together with health professionals, being included in the consultation and decision-making process with the aim of improving stroke treatment and care. Inclusion, in, as, a, um, sorry, inclusion as a consumer is something that we are still trying to get right. And by we, I mean people with lived experience health professionals and researchers. It is very much a two-way street. Clinicians and consumers connecting with each other, respecting the experience that we each bring to the table, our feedback, ideas and suggestions so that the outcome is productive change. Next slide. Thank you. Partnering with consumers, as I said earlier, there has been an increasing emphasis on engaging and partnering with consumers in all sectors of the health system and within research. Next slide, please. The Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare developed a partnering with consumers standard. The standard provides a guide for both consumers and health professionals, and it underpins all of the other Health Commission's standards. The consumer standard focuses on supporting consumers and carers and their families to be actively involved in planning and decision making about their care. Partnering with consumers is the pillar of person-centred care. The purpose of this standard is also about engaging consumers as partners in health service, services in planning, design, delivery and evaluation. Next slide, please. Thank you. So why is the consumer voice important? The value is the consumer voice has been and continues to be a catalyst of change, for change. The consumer voice has created a better understanding of what is important to stroke survivors, their carers and families in all aspects of their stroke care. This starts from when an ambulance is called, to your initial emergency department treatment, acute stroke care, rehabilitation, right through to you living your best life after a stroke. In the 20 years, health professionals and consumers so in the last 20 years, health professionals and consumers have worked together developing and improving systems to provide better um, stroke treatment and care. And just to name a few, the National Stroke 
guidelines provide information to clinicians on best practice in stroke care. Ambulances now go to the right hospital. They can provide thrombolysis, the clot busting drug, and they can go to an endovascular clot um, retrieval centre where they can pull that clot out. There's more emphasis on stroke survivors being cared for in stroke units. And then, as we heard yesterday, the telehealth service, stroke telehealth service that's been developed has been a game changer. So where the country hospital um, can link with the neurologist and get that best treatment for a stroke survivor. And increasingly, stroke researchers are seeking consumer involvement in the development and design of their research. Next picture. Okay, this is me. I mean, she didn't really want this in here, but this is me with Tony Abbott and when he was Prime Minister. And look, as a stroke consumer, I take any opportunity I can get to use my consumer voice to raise stroke awareness and advocate for in increased funding in stroke care and treatment and services. So, <laughs> I'm Rebecca's, don't worry. Um, um, so, next slide, please. Um, I've been fortunate to work alongside clinicians and advocate from a consumer's um, stroke survivor perspective. I use my consumer voice in many different stroke working groups at a local level state level, national level, and international level. Now, these are some of the things that I've been involved in as a stroke consumer over the last 18 years. It started with me joining the New South Wales State Stroke Network in 2004. The State Stroke Network had many name changes, but it is now the um, um, run by the clinical, uh, clinical Innovation, Agency for Clinical Innovation. And I'm fortunate to have a stroke consumer voice um, as a member of the executive committee with Michelle. And that is a, a huge privilege to be you know, in that position in New South Wales. Um, many years ago, I was asked to join the Central Coast Hospital Local Health District Stroke Neurology Meeting. It's held quarterly for health professionals. I'm still involved, involved in that meeting. And so um, quite a few years ago, the um, Central Coast um, Stroke Boards developed their own information for all of the stroke survivors and their families. And it was a really useful um, pack that um, back then was being handed out. And I was asked to review their folder and I suggested that the paper in the resources section, which was all about useful information and services, be changed to a different colour so that it stood out. And, and so to make it easier to find. And the feedback that I got was it had been incredibly useful and stroke survivors and their families found it you know, valuable to just go to this one section easily. That folder was superseded by the Stroke Foundation My Stroke Journey that is now given out in hospitals. And I was also, um, um, you know, when that was being developed, I also had the opportunity as a stroke consumer to provide input into that, that um, My Stroke Journey um, booklet. In 2006, I was asked to be the consumer on the working party to review the Stroke Foundation clinical guidelines. At the time, I was a bit surprised, actually gobsmacked, that stroke clinic, the stroke clinical guidelines didn't address stroke fatigue at all. And during the review process, I took the opportunity to highlight and advocate the importance of the impact post-stroke fatigue had on stroke survivors. And then, in, you know, in 2009, I was again approached to be the consumer on the working party for the Stroke Foundation Guideline Review. And at the end of that review, I was incredibly happy to find out that stroke fatigue had been included for the very first time. Back then, 
I was the only consumer in the working party that reviewed the Stroke Foundation 2007 and 2010 guidelines. So things have changed. There are now many more consumers involved in the guideline review. And the Stroke Foundation now has living guidelines and they are the first stroke living guidelines in the world. And I'm one of the many consumers that are involved in contributing to the guideline, living guideline project. I was a member of the first Stroke Foundation Consumer Council and I was on that council with outstanding people who had a lived experience of stroke. One of them was here last night, Adrian O'Malley. I'm, a, I'm the Stroke Survivor Consumer on the Australian Stroke Coalition. This, the coalition is made up of state clinical networks, health professionals and peak organisations. And the purpose of the Australian Stroke Coalition is to address national stroke priorities. Next slide, please. Sorry, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I was um, a member of the working party that de developed the national acute, okay, this is a really long one, national acute stroke clinical care standard that was launched by the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Health Care in 2015. The working party comprised of prominent clinicians, health professionals, the Stroke Foundation, and two consumers. Eleanor Horton was the carer consumer, and I was the stroke survivor consumer. The Commission made it clear to us that they could own, that the standard could only have seven um, standards to it. And so the working party had to narrow down all the important factors of acute stroke treatment and care down to seven standards. And I was really, really incredible, um, incredibly grateful to be able to contribute at that level so that the essential factors of stroke treatment and care were in that, that standard. And there were many meetings with the working party health professionals, all strongly advocating for what they thought was really important. But Ellen, Eleanor and I persistently raised the importance of a carer standard within the acute care stand, um, stroke um, standard. And we outlined the need for practical training and support to enable carers to provide the care that a stroke survivor would need. And we held our ground. Like we, <laughs> there was a lot of pressure for us to capitulate and you know, there was a lot, lot of lobbying for others um, information to go in there. And so, but the result was, because we held our ground, in the acute um, care um, stroke standard, one of those seven standards is a carer standard. So it was a massive, you know, massive yay to us. And this national standard, the acute stroke standard, is recognised by stroke services. And the carer standard is often being referred to in stroke meetings is becoming embedded in, in Stroke Care Australia-wide. Next one, please. Now, this is um, what I was involved with in 2018. I was invited to be part of an international rapid recommendation panel to review the clinical evidence regarding whether dual antiplatelet therapy of aspirin and clopidogrel Lead to great, a greater reduction in recurrent stroke in people with high risk transient ischemic attack or minor stroke. The international panel comprised of leading clinicians, research methodologists, and consumers. We were referred to as patient partners and carers. The consumers were given training and support to enable us to be able to evaluate the evidence. And when the panel meeting was held to make a recommendation decision, it was late in the evening so that it could accommodate all the different time differences of the panel members. And so at the end of 
considering all the evidence, the decision was made by the panel to recommend dual antiplatelet therapy. So rapid recommendations, international rapid recommendations aim to translate international evidence as, as, a, um, as a, a guideline and, and a recommendation. So I sat at my dining room table at about 11 o'clock at night thinking, oh my goodness, I've just been involved in making a decision that will affect best clinical practice around the world. And the Australian Stroke Living Guidelines have now endorsed that recommendation. Next slide, please. So, yes, the thing about nothing about us without us is very much a strong message. The stroke research community has involved um, consumers as participants in their research. However, now, there is an increasing emphasis on researchers partnering and engaging with people who have a lived experience of stroke right from the very beginning and throughout their research project. That partnership is now widely called co-design. As a result, research funding bodies now usually have a question in the application for the researchers, asking have they involved consumers when they were designing the actual research proposal? So they, they need us. And so that photo is when I, in 2018, I was invited to be, um, to be at the first research grant development um, workshop that was run by the Centre for Research, Ex research Excellence. I was asked to do a presentation on how stroke researchers should involve consumers. This presentation was then used to create 10 top tips for researchers on how to engage with consumers in a meaningful and productive way. In the last five years, the Centre for Research Excellence has run a number of workshops that have brought together consumers and stroke researchers to develop strategies in how researchers should best engage with consumers. This then resulted in another working party of prominent researchers, the Stroke Foundation, the other stroke, another stroke survivor, which was Adrian, who was here last night, and me. And the end result of, of that has been, there has been, a, um, um, was a development of a Stroke Foundation training modules and videos for both researchers and people with a lived experience on how to best work together. And those modules have literally just been launched. It is a great feeling when you realise the observations and suggestions you've made to researchers have made a difference. A few years ago, I was asked to give feedback on a survey that our research, researchers were putting together. And I suggested several simple questions that were obvious to me, and um, they were added to their survey. And what that happened was their results provided more information that they hadn't really counted on and out of those questions that I'd suggest be added, which actually became the basis of further research that they did. And as a result of my contribution, because back then, you know, they they asked me would I like to be co-author in their research? And I thought, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> so next slide please. One of the things I often say is, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Change in the stroke arena takes time. In some cases, many years. The consumer voice has the ability to influence the changes that need to be made. There are many ways we as consumers can bite that elephant and make it sit up and take notice. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, P 
people who have a lived experience of stroke have a wealth of knowledge and experience. And it's this knowledge and experience they bring to the table with their consumer voice that influences change. Our involvement and contribution becomes a win-win for all, for both health professionals, researchers, and for people who are living with stroke. Thank you.